tell the kids, we have evidence from development. Now this one makes me angry. So I'm going to try to stay calm while we talk about this is probably one of the most dangerous lies in the textbooks. We'll just calm down now. Yeah, calm down. Just say, hold me back, hold me back, when you weren't really going to do anything but pretend to be morally outraged at something you obviously didn't understand in the least. Okay, I'm ready. This textbook says the similarity between the early stages of development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. Darwin considered this the strongest class of facts in favor of his theory. This was the best evidence Darwin knew of for his theory. The guy who made up this dumb idea is named Ernst Haeckel. Okay, so the preacher says that none of this is real, that Haeckel just made it up, and that Haeckel's drawings were the evidence that convinced Darwin in the first place. Remember that when it comes up again in a moment. Haeckel called this idea we're about to share with you the biogenetic law, which means as animals develop inside the mother, they go through the stages of evolution. All you got to do is memorize the word farm, F-A-R-M, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. That's the way they say it happened. The phrase they had for it back then was ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Wow, what's all that mean? Well, ontogeny is the growth of the baby. It goes through stages, okay. Recapitulates means it reenacts or does over again. Phylogeny is the evolutionary sequence. This much is true. Ernst Haeckel was an accomplished artist and a passionate science communicator, but he failed to establish his biogenetic law because he made it too specific and dependent on what are now outdated ideas on the taxonomic orders. For example, the words fish, amphibian, and reptile are all paraphyletic, meaning that they include all of these except for these, which is both arbitrary and inconsistent. Modern taxonomy is monophyletic, meaning that it is composed of clades that include all their descendants. At once upon a time, people invented the genus Pongo to encompass all apes except for humans. And some sources even said all hominoids, which is the Latin word for ape, except humans, which is a Freudian admission that they already know that we are one of them, and it was completely arbitrary. Carolus Linnaeus, the creationist who invented taxonomy, challenged the scientific community of his day to show him a generic character by which to distinguish man from ape, because he couldn't tell the difference between them, and no one else could either. So they made up a bogus category just so that they could say that humans and apes were in different boxes, even when they knew better. I took a college course on evolution in 1992 when they were still teaching Linnaean taxonomy with the admission that they already knew that it no longer works and that it had to be revised to accommodate for the growing volume of evidence from genetics and microbiology to say nothing of the wealth of transitional species that were then being discovered in quick succession. So very soon after that they switched to a cladistic system where humans are formally recognized as one of several species of ape. It's not just that we came from apes, it's that we're still apes right now. We're still monkeys, too, because we belong to the taxonomic suborder Anthropoidea, also known as simiaforms, and those names mean, respectively, human-like and monkeys. We'll talk more about that in another episode. The new taxonomy is a twin-nested hierarchy, now based on genetics as much as on morphology, overlapping homology and embryology. The new system required that we finally get around to correcting some 19th century notions now known to be in error. For example, our evolutionary ancestors were at one time amphibious, but they were not amphibians, because the taxonomic order amphibia is a sister group to amniotes, not an ancestral clade. Our ancestors were never reptiles either, because the word reptile doesn't mean cold-blooded, scaly, egg-laying things with claws like it used to because there are several things that are unambiguously reptiles, but that don't meet all of those criteria, or any of them in some cases. So now reptiles are a subset of diapsids, and mammals are a subset of synapsids. The word fish doesn't mean anything in taxonomy either, because again, there's no consistent definition, and it too is paraphyletic, so we use chordate or vertebrate instead. The words fish, amphibian, and reptile are colloquial images with some value in normal parlance, but with no consistent definition or application. And one amusing thing about that is that there is either no such thing as a fish, or humans are all still monkey fish, and we always will be. This Irish textbook says, the presence of fish-like structures in embryos of different species shows these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. 
It's as if the embryo retains a memory of its origins and starts to copy them during its development. That's the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. No, it isn't, although that is what it should be. This is a good demonstration of how all of what we call the natural laws are merely the properties of nature that have been identified and described by people in simple summary statements or mathematics equations, and they're not always correct. In fact, there were two very different laws proposed by rival scientists, both circulating at the same time, Haeckel's biogenetic law and Rudolf Virchow's law of biogenesis, and both of these laws turned out to be wrong. Actually, both of them were correct, but only up to a point. And we'll talk about how Rudy Virchow's law of biogenesis failed in an upcoming episode. For Haeckel, that point was in specifying that the embryo recapitulates the adult forms of its phylogeny. If he hadn't specified that it would become a fish and an amphibian and a reptile before becoming a mammal, then we might still be teaching his poetic phrase, which no one currently teaches, by the way. At this point in the series, would it be surprising to anyone that the preacher got everything wrong again? Now the idea that sick mind Freud relied on was the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that is, the development of the individual recapitulates the evolution of the entire species. This is stupid and dangerous. How could that be dangerous? In what way did Sigmund Freud rely on Haeckel's biogenetic law? What could that possibly have to do with psychiatry? We don't know because the preacher doesn't read original sources, only opinion pieces written by other creationists in the same echo chamber. So I tried to find the original source and first found this article from Frontiers in Psychology. It criticizes Freud for integrating biogenetic theory with Lamarckian evolution, both of which had been disproved by that time. And beyond that, the article says that nowadays, the extended neo-Darwinian synthesis and effective neuroscience may pave the way for rational Darwinian approach to human mental disorders, which would take into account the whole neurological and psychological evolution of the species and be centered on emotions and their vicissitudes. So the Darwinian perspective is currently justifiable, where the Lamarckian notion, promoted by Freud and also by Haeckel, was not. They tell the kids the embryo, the baby growing in the mother, has gills like a fish. No, they didn't. No textbook ever said that. Gill pouches are not the same thing as gills. Gills? That's a lie. Those are not gill slits. Those little folds of skin you see on the embryo grow into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. My uncle had five or six chins and he couldn't breathe through any of them but the top one. Okay? <laughs> Those are not gill slits. Yes, they are. Look at the preacher's own slide that he showed a moment ago. When it says fish-like structures, that means the structures are like gills. It doesn't mean that they are gills. And the preacher didn't say this part, but we can read what he didn't and see that it says that these structures persist in adult fish but are absent from other adult vertebrates, although the eustachian tube in humans is the remains of the gill slits. That's not a lie. <laughs> That's correct. They do have something to do with gills in fish, and these same structures appear at the same stage of development in all other vertebrate species too, and there is no reason why they would unless they evolved. So in tetrapods, four-legged walking animals, there was a change such that these pharyngeal pouches or clefts or slits or whatever you want to call them developed into these other organs instead, just as a series of transitional species illustrate too, because that's how they evolved. Being slits that can become gills doesn't make them gills. You can call them pharyngeal slits or pouches if you prefer, but if they grow into gills on fish, then they are gill slits by definition. Ernst Haeckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Darwin's book in 1860. See, Darwin's book was printed in English in 1859. The next year, it was printed in German, 1860. Haeckel was a German embryology professor. No, he wasn't. Until that time, Hickel was just a medical doctor, but after reading Darwin's book, he went back to college, and a couple years later, he became a zoology professor who personally discovered, described, and named thousands of new species, and he coined many terms in biology, including ecology, phylum, phylogeny, and protista. He read the book and said, wow, what a great theory. If only we had some evidence. By then, Hickel had already discovered evidence on his own including the taxonomic prediction of some organisms before they were even confirmed to exist. Well, nine years later, they still had no evidence. 
Darwin had already presented sufficient evidence in his book to convince the scientific community, and at least one of his specific predictions was discovered just two years after publication, offering even more profound evidence than had ever been seen before. So his theory was well established and vindicated even in that first decade. So Haeckel decided to help out. He was going to make some evidence. Haeckel took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo. He was an embryology professor, you know. No, he was a professor of zoology and of comparative anatomy, not embryology. And he lied. He faked the drawings, he changed them and made them look exactly alike to prove they're related. No, he didn't. Haeckel was facing a looming deadline for the first edition of his book, Anthropogene, which was hastily assembled from other drawings, and he had run out of time. So for that first edition, and only for that first edition, he used the same image for both dogs and humans. When a reviewer noticed that they were in fact the same picture, Haeckel said that didn't matter because it looked the same at that stage anyway. Which, if you match the stages of development instead of counting passage of time, accounting for different gestation periods, then indeed they do look the same at that stage. He didn't need or want to fake anything. Every edition after that first one had the advantage of better instrumentation and the accuracy of the drawings improved. But there was nothing wrong with those images in the first place. He just is a bald-faced lie, okay? Indeed. Though it is not the lie that the preacher wants to make it out to be. Remember that the preacher just told us that Darwin thought that the greatest evidence of evolution was comparative embryology, leading him to write his book on evolution, which was the turning point for Haeckel's thinking when he then quit his medical practice, and nine years later, according to this preacher, Haeckel then faked the drawings that originally inspired Darwin to write his book decades earlier, because the preacher said that Haeckel made all this up. So how can that be? This reminds me of a movie where an old lady gives a young man a watch and then he travels back in time and meets her as a young woman and gives her back the watch. So who made the watch? You should all know that when Darwin wrote his book, he had never heard of Haeckel. Haeckel had yet to put pencil to paper and had not even conceived of his biogenetic law. Darwin was looking at real embryos through a microscope with his own eyes. Those similarities are real. Haeckel didn't make them up. And the preacher got all of that wrong, too. Haeckel made giant posters of his fake drawings and traveled all over Germany and converted the people to believing in evolution. The drawings Haeckel traveled with were not fake. And surprisingly, Haeckel himself didn't believe in Darwinian evolution either. He respected Darwin, of course, and he liked the idea of a tree of life, which he beautifully illustrated himself. But like many other Germans and Russians of that time, Haeckel rejected the mechanism of natural selection, holding instead to a form of Lamarckism, wherein he thought the environment externally prompted new varieties of species. Which led to the next obvious question, hey, if evolution is true, I wonder which uh, race of humans have evolved the farthest. And guess who the Germans thought it was? That wouldn't be an obvious question to me, nor to any Darwinist I can think of. Though Lamarckians did think differently. So the preacher does have a point here. Haeckel was German. And unlike Darwin, Haeckel was an evangelical Christian and a racist who disagreed with Darwin on the origin of man. Haeckel was a polygenist who believed that each of the imagined human races evolved separately from different primate ancestors by Lamarckian means rather than Darwinian mechanisms. And if humans had evolved separately at different times as he imagined, then that meant that some humans had evolved further than others. And Darwin argued against all of that, saying that the question of whether mankind consists of one or several species has of late years been much discussed by anthropologists who are divided into two schools of monogenists and polygenists. Uh, Darwin held that all humanity arose from one common source, and he dismissed polygenists on the excuse that if different races of humans had evolved from gorillas or orangutans, then there would be evidence of that. But there isn't any. He then concluded that when the principle of evolution is generally accepted, as it surely will be before long, the dispute between monogenists and polygenists will die a silent and unobserved death. Thus, another of Darwin's predictions was fulfilled. Ah, uh, yeah. We'll talk more about that later. Yes, we will in the next episode. But for right now, I've got to mention one more point where Haeckel and Darwin differed. 
Haeckel rejected natural selection as a biological mechanism, but he bought into a perversion of that that was promoted by another Lamarckian, an economist named Herbert Spencer. Spencer is the one who came up with the phrase survival of the fittest in a socio-political concept that he called social Darwinism, and he applied that to ethics, or rather, the lack thereof, identifying the rich as the strong and the poor as the weak. If this had happened in the 20th century, Darwin could have sued Spencer for tarnishing his name and misrepresenting his theory with notions Darwin himself did not agree with and thus should not be associated with and that had nothing to do with his theory. Now on top are Haeckel's fake drawings. Underneath are the actual photographs of these animals. He lied. No. In this case, the photographs are the lie. The damning photographs published by Michael Robertson showed these embryos with yolk and other maternal material that made them look very different. That and the chicken was photographed at a different angle with a different lens effect than the others, while the salamander was a different size. Haeckel clearly indicated that his drawings were only of the embryos themselves, omitting things like yolk, and, and that he made them all the same size and oriented the same way for ease of comparison. So there's no foul to fault here. Robertson, the very researcher who indicted Haeckel in 1997, seems to have softened his view since then, perhaps after his own errors in the indictment itself were brought to light by the University of Chicago's 2008 article, Haeckel's Embryos, Fraud Not Proven. In a November 2002 paper published in the Biological Reviews of the Cambridge Philosophical Society titled Haeckel's ABC of Evolution and Development, Robertson co-wrote the statement that Haeckel's much-criticized embryo drawings are important as phylogenetic hypotheses, teaching aids, and as evidence for evolution. While some criticism of the drawings are legitimate, others are more tendentious. Cologne University held a trial and convicted him of fraud. He said at the trial, I should feel utterly condemned were it not that hundreds of the best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. I can find no evidence of this trial. All we know is that Rudy Virchow, the guy proposing the law of biogenesis, rejected evolution and refused to accept evidence for it, and he accused Haeckel of fraud. Haeckel made the cited statement in the public media of that day, admitting his mistake in the process. There was no conviction of any charges. Haeckel remained professor of zoology and comparative anatomy with that university for another 34 years after that, and he went on to become famous as an award-winning science communicator. In 1894, Haeckel received the gold medal of the Linnaean Society, and in 1908 he was awarded the Darwin Wallace Medal, whereupon he also established the Philetic Museum for that university, from which he then retired. Haeckel was like the science guy of his day. This is Mount Haeckel nestled between Mount Darwin and Mount Wallace in California, just south of Mount Mendel. But Mount Haeckel overlooks the Evolution Basin. And there's another Mount Haeckel in New Zealand. That's how well respected this guy was in his time. So Haeckel was never convicted of fraud. But it is ironic to hear that accusation coming from this particular preacher, who is himself a convicted fraud, who feigns righteous indignation at the idea that someone else might have done what he does. This biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail. It's not true. But it can't be taken out of the textbooks for some reason. The biogenetic law isn't in any of the textbooks. It's been proven wrong since 1875, and they still keep it in the books. That trial never happened. The biogenetic law was not disproved in 1875. It remained popular for at least another quarter century after that. But it declined from 1900 to 1930 due to improvements in microbiology, which eventually rendered the biogenetic law scientifically untenable. It's still used in this book. Evolutionary Analysis, College Textbook, 1998 edition, used at University of West Florida, the exact same chart of Ernst Haeckel. That's only been proven wrong since 1875, okay? I know it takes a while to get textbooks up to date, but uh, that's long enough. I think 130 years, they ought to be able to get it out by now, don't you think? Okay. The biogenetic law is not in that book. Those are Haeckel's drawings of comparative embryos. Those are real. Microphotographs prove that. There is nothing about recapitulation in there. Darwin's theory, his book came out 1859. He predicted they would find evidence. And they did. 1869, Haeckel faked the drawings. No, he didn't. 1875, it was proven wrong. No, that was 40 to 50 years later. But it's still in textbooks used all over the planet. No, the biogenetic law isn't used in any textbook anywhere in the world.
2004 textbook, still has it. 2005 textbook, and I pronounced it wrong, it's Chickasha, not Chickasha, Chickasha, Oklahoma. I got corrected during the break. Uh, still teaching the baby has gill pouches. Because they do. Notice, for example, gill pouches, okay? Gill slits on the embryo. They're teaching this in textbooks all over the world. It's only been proven wrong since 1875. Get it out of the book. Tear the page out. I mean, it's, not, it's a no-brainer. Tear out the page. It's not true. Yes, it definitely is. This preacher is painfully unaware of anything he professes, and he is hopelessly confused. The biogenetic law is not the claim that embryos have pharyngeal pouches or gill slits or whatever you prefer to call them. That's a fact. Those are real. The biogenetic law was a failed attempt to explain why that is. Ernst Haeckel's mistake was in saying that an embryo recapitulates the adult stages of its evolution. But another Ernst, Carl Ernst von Baer, corrected him, saying that the embryo of the higher animal form never resembles the adult of another animal form, such as one less evolved, but only its embryo. Von Baer is the one who established the laws of embryology, not Haeckel, and those laws remain valid today. Haeckel was wrong, but von Baer was right. Now, we no longer think in terms of higher or lower life forms, although that was ubiquitous centuries before Darwin's time, and it doesn't make sense to describe anything as more evolved than something else. An embryological development doesn't technically recapitulate phylogeny, but otherwise it is a fact that biological development really does parallel evolutionary development. That as a population changes, that change is recorded in embryology, sequentially, but only developmentally. We can't use Heckel's poetically phrased biogenetic law to note that correlation, so we had to change it to the more sophomoric sounding law called Evo Devo. Here's a junior high textbook telling them it has uh, embryo has gills. Let's... And here's photographic evidence proving that they do. This one says, similarly, humans and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. Three, these similarities provide evidence that these three animals evolved from a common ancestor, tiny gill slits. Gill slits on the human embryo. Gills of fish. Tiny gill pouches used in college textbooks. You know that a gill pouch or cleft or slit is not a gill, right? This preacher doesn't seem to understand that. There's a 2004 textbook saying it has evidence of evolution is seen in uh, development of embryos. Once again, if a fact or body of facts, as these all are, positively indicate one particular conclusion or eliminate the alternative, then they are indicative, and that makes them evidence. This commonality in all vertebrates that is completely different from arthropods and mollusks or anything else is evidence of evolution and is inexplicable any other way. This preacher refuses to admit that there is evidence of evolution because he doesn't have any evidence to show for creationism, but that's his problem. You can't get a high score on SAT or ACT tests unless you lie and say the baby has gill pouches. It's found on every single test we could find. You will not get a high score if you ignore the facts and try to pretend that the embryo does not have gill pouches when we have libraries full of photographs proving that they do. And the preacher has already admitted that they do when he said that these gill pouches grow into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. So he knows that they're there. He just doesn't like what they're called or what they imply. If you don't believe in evolution, you won't score high to get into college. Or at least give the evolution answer. Just give the correct answer. Admit that these pouches really do exist. Call them pharyngeal, if you like, and figure out the difference between them and the law meant to explain them. Then once you've done that, then you can go on to believing whatever alternative reality you want to imagine instead of telling it like it is and was. Just learn the facts long enough to pass the test before you reject reality again and put your head back in the sand.